hand and he bowed the knee, Ephesians 3.14. He says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, length, depth, and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Let's pray. Great God and Father in heaven, Lord, uh, Lord, we need you. And we know that the Bible says that you're there for us. And Lord, I know that people are struggling, people are hurting out in the world and getting beat up. We know that this world is, is a fallen world. We know that it's a beautiful world and creation is beautiful. But Lord, there's just something out there that, that always is making us mindful of the fact that there's a void and there's something that's not right. And that void can only be replaced. It can only be filled, Lord, with you. And Lord... As we break open the scriptures today, I pray that you'll bless us and help us to just study a few things so that we will know that you are there and that we can take comfort, we can have the love and the faith and the comprehension that you are there and that there's a great blessing that's even greater than we can see or even know or think, God, I pray, and that we can be better church members and walk with greater boldness and greater faithfulness and greater love for you and for our brothers and sisters, and for the lost and dying world, and I pray that you will bless us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now look at verse 20. Now to him who's able to do exceedingly abundantly. I'm told that, that there in the Greek here is five uh, adjectives that just express this principle in a positive way, that God is able. He can do exceedingly abundantly, above all we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. We have a God who loves us. He's able. And, you know, we talk about the grace of God. We talk about the love of God. God is holy. God is just. You know, I've been preaching about Judas and preaching about hell. And, you know, you've got to preach the whole counsel of God. But I would shudder to think that my congregation and the people that I preach to, the people that uh, of the community, I would shudder to think, that we didn't talk about a God who is able to take care of us, a God who is there for us. You know, it's hard times now, isn't it, economically? Uh, Our jobs, our livelihoods, the mortgages, the car payments, the vehicle breakdowns that we have, all of those things. And uh, we're not exempt from the laws of nature, are we, from the laws of physics, things that break down and You know, it's so easy to be discouraged today. And and what can be worse than machines breaking down? Uh, But other things break down. Uh, Our marriages break down. Our homes break down. There's so many things that can go wrong. And how difficult it is to maintain uh, our homes and our families. And how hard it is to maintain a congregation. Because the devil's always pulling and tugging, isn't he? The, The devil's always trying to plant seeds of corruption. And that's the way it is. And... So it's a fight. There's always a struggle. You never feel like, you know, you can totally relax and just sit down and say, I've arrived. Well, the good news is Paul had that feeling too. He said, I never have been able to say I've arrived. But he said, I know one thing. I keep pressing on, pushing on to the future, forgetting the past behind me. One of the great scriptures of consolation is this Ephesians 3.20. We have a God who's able, and he's able to do more. Now, look at this. The things that the little reference there. In line three, he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or even think. Now, I know that Jesus said that whatever you ask in my name will be given to you. And I wonder sometimes, why don't we have things? Why don't we have things that are godly things that we pray for that are for the good, that God would give us? Do we pray? And sometimes I wonder, maybe the reason we don't have is because we're not asking for God as we should. We're not praying to God, and we're not doing it in the right manner, in Jesus' name. Because Jesus said, and, you know, we need to prove God. God is a God in Malachi 3. He said, prove me. 
and see if I won't work. And, of course, he was talking about the giving to God. And God said, try to prove me and see if, if you can outgive me because I'll give you a return that you won't even be able to hold. And that's the same prayer Jesus is praying, and we ask in his name. And so we need to ask God in, in Ephesians 3.20. But there's one more thing that scares me. Not only can God do more than we can even ask, but what scares me is that he can do more than we can even think. The problem is we're locked in that old proverbial box, aren't we? Our comfort zone, our mental zone, and sometimes we can't even imagine things for God. The Bible said in the Old Testament that the people perish because there's no vision. And, beloved, we need to have a vision. A vision for the Lord, a vision for the kingdom of God. Is the kingdom of God in your vision? Is the kingdom of God in your thoughts? What am I talking about, about the kingdom of God? I'm talking about the church. Wouldn't it be good if God would raise up men and soul winners? We have so many jobs to do, and we've tried. We've, you know we've tried. And just trying to get people and, and just pin down that commitment factor. Serving God and doing things for Jesus. But I'm asking today, and the Lord's asking us, that we take him serious on this Ephesians 3.20, what Paul's writing. That God is able to do things greater than we can even ask him or greater than we can even imagine, even greater than we can think. Now, that's a frightening thing because, you know, I would hate to think that someday I'll give an account to God and I couldn't even have a vision to do something greater than myself. A vision to do something great for God. I want you to know God is going to be there. In spite, in spite of our weaknesses, in spite of our infirmities, in spite of our bugbears, God is able to do a good work. I think if we could just humble ourselves and just fall down to the knee like Paul. I think that's the secret right there, is that verse in verse 14. If we could just humble ourselves and fall down on our knee. Our physical knee, yes, but our spiritual knee. And uh, cry out to God, because God is a God who's going to be there. Now, the first group of people that God is there for are alien sinners. Every one of us came to God. Whether you grew up in the church or not, every one of us came to God as a sinner. And God is near to sinners. In Acts chapter 17, turn with me, if you will. And I want you to turn in the scriptures, just because I have a PowerPoint slide. I, I've just put up the skeleton, but to get the full thing, I need you to be uh, with your Bibles opened and uh, in that Word of God. In Acts 17, Paul great, gave a great sermon. This was in Athens, Greece. This would be like speaking to the university professors. And the people that brought him up on the Mars Hill, I visited Mars Hill. <laughs> I preached on Mars Hill. I preach, I memorized Paul's sermon. I preached Paul's sermon on Mars Hill, and, and the Greeks speak English as a second language, and they were all, when I got done, you know, uh, some people thought I was crazy. Maybe I was, and all the Greeks applauded and said, what a great drama. You know, Greeks love uh, dramas and plays and togas and things like that. And, but I preached this sermon, and according to the text here, he was taken up on this Areopagus. It was a big rock outcrop. There were so many steps, I think like 18 steps. There was a certain number of steps that were engraved in this rock, and that's where the Supreme Court met. And Paul was speaking and preaching this sermon, and he was talking to alien sinners. I mean, these guys were pagan Greek, had never heard of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I was so thankful and because when we visited Athens, it says in, uh, in Acts 17 that Paul preached in the marketplace. And there he uh, preached Jesus, preached him in the marketplace, and uh, also, he was taken up on this Areopagus, Acts 17, 19. They took him to the, to the, marketplace, to the uh, Areopagus because they wanted to hear what he had to say. And the marketplace was in verse 17, and the Areopagus was in verse 19. And he preached Jesus. I mean, these were lost, totally foreign. When we visited Athens, they still have the marketplace there. They call it the Agora. That's the place where we do business. You know, we need to preach the gospel, be Christians in our business place, in our place of work. That's the number one place to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ is uh, at work and among our friends. Not pushing it on people, but if it's brought up, sharing your faith. There's nothing wrong with that. People love talking politics and religion. That's the biggest lie ever told. People love to talk to other people who have convictions. Maybe even, even if you disagree, the world is still impressed by people who have convictions. As we visited Athens, do you know the main street there in that capital city of Greece is called the Apostle Paul Avenue? 
the Apostle Paul Avenue. You tell me that history doesn't prove that history is his story. What did Paul say? They were given to idolatry. They had all these statues of gods and goddesses. And even today, they have all those pagan statues. You know, we call them myths today. Mythology. But the Greeks didn't call their myths myths. That was their religion. <laughs> that was church. You know, you go to these shrines and they have these little temples where all, you know, we, we admire the architecture. Look at those columns, those Corinthian columns and the Ionic and the Doric and, you know, admire the architect. That was their church building. They worshiped those gods and goddesses. And what did Paul say in Acts 17? Well, in verse 24, he says, you guys need to go back to Genesis. There was a creator. Don't believe in evolution. We believe in creation. God created the heavens and the earth and all these things. He doesn't dwell in these buildings. The building doesn't make you holy. Need a roof over your head, of course. But your building, your temple, isn't some place made out of marble and granite and architecture. Our body is the temple of the living God. We are the church. We are the building of God. We are the habitation where God's Holy Spirit resides in our heart. And then he talked about God's predestined plan in verse 26, how that God mapped out the whole human race. And all the maps, if you, if you look at a map, all the countries there, you know every country, there's some exceptions, every country is basically a linguistic unit. Because after the Tower of Babel, every tribe began to assemble among those who spoke the same language, had a commonality of language. And to this day, when you look at a map, basically you're looking at the leftover remnant of all those uh, uh, linguistic units that God created at the Tower of Babel. And God had mapped out all the whole human race had a place to live. And what does that tell us? God even treats the sinners good. God blesses sinners. Even those who don't love God, God loves them. That's the kind of God we have. And what does that tell me today as a preacher? As a husband, as a father, the nature of God is to love and to be loving. Even when people are undeserving, even when you're unloved, you still love. Why? Because it works? It does work, but that's not the number one reason. The number one reason is because that's God's nature. You're embracing who God is when you love sinners and you love the unlovable, even if it's your wife. Or your husband. Amen. You know what I'm talking about. That's the essence of Christ. The gospel, First John says, why do we love him? He taught us how to love because he first loved us. Oh, how we love Jesus because he first loved us. And, and in Acts 17, 27, what was the purpose of all God's plans? So that they should seek the Lord. Who's the they? That would be the nations of men. The word nations in the Greek is the uh, ethnos. Ethnic groups. It's translated Gentiles. Sometimes your, your, your version will translate it Gentiles. Sometimes it will translate it the nations. You see, back in the Old Testament, it was the Jews and everybody else. Abraham is my father, and then there's all the other people. Too, too bad. You know, you didn't get in on our you know, birthright. And that was the way they thought. You ever read about Jews sending out missionaries in the Old Testament? You ever hear about you know, the, the, the Bar Mitzvah, the, the, the Temple Bethel, ever sending missionaries out to convert the world? There's no missionary groups. It's us. Us and them. But you see, God loves sinners. Whenever you read about Acts in the New Testament, you know how much of Acts is dedicated to the missionary journeys? Going out. Go into all the world. Matthew 28. Preach the gospel to every creature. Baptize them in the name of the Father and Son. We're looking out because God loves sinners. And I'll tell you something else here. I got a good version, New King James, this morning. Because in verse 27, it says that the God's plan was that these people should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him. Now, the old King James says, feel after him. That's okay. But the new King James is groping. You know what that means, grope? It means we are in darkness. Alien sinners are in darkness. And they're having a hard time coming to the light. And even when they come to the light, what happens when blind people get light in their eyes? It makes it worse, doesn't it? And they're being blinded, and so they're groping. That's what Paul uses the word. It's like in a cave or in a dark room trying to find your way. And that's the way every man is actually coming to God, and that's God's plan. You know, there's some people that say you're just predestinated to be, to be uh, totally depraved and totally, uh, you have total inability to come to God. You know, God only gives to you the right to come to Him. But that's not what Acts 17 says. 
We're actually groping to God. And He's right there waiting for us. If happily we should feel after Him and find Him, because He is not far from every one of us. You see that word, 27? He is not far from each one of us. He's not far from every man. Every, any, each, the whole human race is so close to God, and they don't even know it. In Acts 17, verse 30, Truly the times of ignorance God overlooked. Young people, don't you, aren't you thankful that your mom and dad overlooked a few things when you were growing up? I mean, there was the serious sins, you know, that merited the, the chastisement. But I'm thankful to God. I had a merciful mom and dad. Where did they get their mercy from? Didn't they learn it from the Heavenly Father? Learn to show mercy. When you got somebody on the hook and you let them go, God overlooked our ignorance in many ways, many times in the Old Testament. I had some guy trying to say, hey, Abraham had, you know, two wives. David had all those wives. You know, how did that make it right? You know, they had many wives. Maybe I can have many wives. <laughs> Are you crazy? One's enough. <laughs> One husband's enough. Jesus said, you've forgotten what he did in the beginning. He made them male and female. One man and one woman. Just because people had breakdowns in the Old Testament and violated those precepts, never made it right. That didn't make it right. David having those wives, Solomon having those, it was wrong. It was a sin. And it never made it right. God's plan was always for one man and one woman. But, you know, they took advantage of God. But what did God do? To his credit, he overlooked ignorance in the Old Covenant. But now he commands all men to repent. Now on this side of the cross. Now on this side of the day of Pentecost, on this side of the preaching of John the Baptist and Jesus Christ, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. We have a God who loves us. He's close, and he's near to sinners. Second Peter 3.9 says that God is, not, is long-suffering. We have a God who long-suffers. He's patient. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I don't know about you, but you know, that's a great consolation. God long suffers, and he bears with us. Like a loving father, he bears with us. And so God is close. God is near. But let me go on. God takes the part of his children. In Genesis 20, probably one of the most shocking stories, in Genesis 20, 2 and 3, God takes the part of his children, even probably when they don't deserve it. God takes his part. Abraham got into trouble. I don't know how Abraham lost his faith, as it were. He forgot the promise of God. It had been a while since God had revealed to him. But he journeyed down south. He went into Philistine country. And there he went to Kadesh and stayed in the land of Shur and in the land of Gerar. It was Philistine country. Down there, Gaza, along the Mediterranean coast, the land of the Philistines. It was toward Egypt. The Philistia was between Israel and Egypt. And now Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech, the king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. You know, I don't know what Abraham was thinking. You know, his wife Sarah, the Bible says she was very beautiful. She was desirable. You know, men beheld her beauty. They wanted her. And uh, she belonged to Abraham. The word Sarah means princess. Princess. And she was a beautiful woman. And Abraham must have for forgotten who you know, who was protecting him all those years and defending him. It was God up in heaven. And so he thought, you know, I have this plan, Sarah. Why don't you go along with it? Uh, somebody's going to try to steal you away or kill me because you're so beautiful. They're going to want you to be their wife. Why don't you just say you're my sister? And then, you know, I won't suffer such a fate. Far from preventing it, now as a sister, she's available. It made it worse. And so sure enough, the king of Gerard wants Sarah and takes her. After all, you know, she's a sister. She's available. But verse 3, God, but God, see that word but? But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, I like the old King James, Behold, you are a dead man. Indeed, you are a dead man. You know, I don't know, does that get your attention in the Bible when you read God coming up to somebody and saying, I'm going to kill you? You know, God did that before. You know, God came to Moses. I don't know if you remember that. It was in Numbers, not Exodus, but in Numbers. He said, I'm going to kill. It says, the Lord 
came along the place desiring to kill Moses because Moses got in trouble. He did something wrong, and God was angry, and God was going to kill him. You know, God, God can get mad, and God can get mad and kill somebody. And the greatest form of capital punishment in the, in the Bible, my friend, is the eternal lake of fire. Now, that's capital punishment. I've talked to, you know, political people who debate. They don't believe in capital punishment. You know, the mo- I've had Christians say, we don't believe in capital punishment. Capital punishment doesn't come from Abraham. That's not Old Testament. It came from Noah. You're eating meat, aren't you? Yeah. We got a rainbow in the sky, don't we? Yeah. We got four seasons, right? Summer, fall, spring, and uh, harvest. Yeah. That's the Noahian covenant. Well, a part of that Noahian covenant is we still, the blood is sacred. The life is in the blood. He who sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God, he created him. I never hear anybody put that verse on. I've heard people say, you know, whoso shed man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. But I never heard him repeat the next verse. For in the image of God, he created them. It's a creation argument. Capital punishment is proof of creation. Because when you shed somebody's blood, that blood is so precious and valuable that that blood is going to be on you. And that's why there's capital punishment. But, beloved, the greatest form of capital punishment is to hear those words, depart from me, you wicked men, you wicked servants, into everlasting fire. They'll be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now, that's capital punishment. Jesus said, don't worry about who can kill your body. You fear who can kill your body and your soul and your spirit forever. God's a tough guy. And he's loving, he's merciful, he's long-suffering, he's patient. But let me say this. (laughs) You never want to cross God the Father. Because God takes a part of his children. Abraham lied, was being selfish perhaps, came up with some foolish plan, and Sarah, bless her heart, went along with it. Sarah submitted to Abraham even though in her heart maybe she knew that was wrong. Maybe she should have reminded Abraham, you know, God takes care. God will take my part. You know what I learned, beloved? Uh, You know, as a father, don't you have a little insecurity? Are there some insecurities out there? You know, how are we going to make a living? How are we going to take care of our families and our children? And, you know, d- d- as a father, you, we have to endure those insecurities of life. But, you know, beloved, it occurred to me this week, I'm not, really not the provider of my family. Who's the provider of my family? God's the provider. His name is Yahweh Jireh. God provides. You know, I just had this peace come over me because I know that if I'm in the will of God, God is providing. And I'm just a conduit for his provision. Amen? Amen. And it gave me such great faith, such great consolation that I can get up and uh, I don't have to give in to fears and insecurities because God uh, loves his children. And as long as I'm a child of God, I don't have to be afraid of anything. And, you know, God said to Abimelech, I'm going to kill you. You're a dead man because the woman you have is a man's wife. Now, bless Abimelech's heart. He was innocent. He said, Lord, uh, you've got to read the text here. Did she not say, verse 5, uh, Abimelech, Lord, will you slay a righteous nation also? Abimelech knew, not only is he going to kill the king, but he's going to wipe out the whole Philistine race over one tampering with one woman. Now, why was Abraham and Sarah so important to, to the God that he would wipe out anybody who even messed? Because God had already promised Abraham that your seed someday is going to give birth to the Messiah. My son Jesus is going to be born according to the flesh, through your loins. You see why the devil wanted to pervert? You know, could you imagine Satan laughing with glee if Sarah became pregnant by the evil, wicked king of Philistia? The whole plan of God would have been aborted. And that even makes it more dramatic. And Abimelech seemed to be more righteous than Abraham, I'm sorry to say. He said, will you slay a righteous nation? Didn't he say to me, she's my sister? And even she herself said, yeah, even Sarah went along with it. He's my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. And God said to him in a dream, yes, I know you did this in the integrity of your heart, for I also withheld you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. You see how good God is. God didn't wait till he fell into the trap and then hold him accountable. God intervened. God stopped Abimelech from sinning so he didn't have to kill him. And so God saved the day. He said, now you go restore. Verse 7. Restore the man's wife. Now, 
I mean, could you imagine? This is so embarrassing. Could you imagine if, you know, you were Abraham, men, you know, a, a preacher or the leader of your family, a shepherd, a spiritual shepherd, an elder or a deacon, and you tell a white lie. It was a half lie. She, they, she was a half sister. So it was one of those lies you could tell thinking it might be justified. But is lying ever justified? Even a white lie is still a lie. Even a half lie is still a lie, isn't it? And uh, can you imagine? I mean, Abraham is as guilty as sin, and yet Ab- God is telling Abimelech, I'm going to kill you. And now this Abraham, who's lied to you, uh, by the way, did I mention he's a prophet? Of, <laughs> he's a prophet. He's my prophet, and he's going to come and pray for you. Restore the man's wife, for he's a prophet. He will pray for you, and you shall live. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. This is one of those weird stories in the Bible. You know why? I'm glad it's there. What's the lesson to be learned? You ask the world today, what's righteousness? Who's righteous? And they'll tell you, being a nice guy. Being nice. You know, I used to believe, say, believe that uh, John Wesley said, the leader of, the founder of the Methodist religion, I'm amazed at all these pithy sayings that come out from people. Cleanliness is next to godliness. I mean, I've heard that all my life. Cleanliness is next to godliness. But I didn't know that it was John Wesley who said that. So we went down to the American Frontier Culture Museum, and they had a special exhibit that, that summer. The Frontier Culture smelled bad. It stunk. People in the old days, they didn't have deodorant and invent antiperspirants like we have today and perfumes. You know, they just had to grin and bear it. Cleanliness is next to godliness. That's not in the Bible. But how many people, you know, live by that proverb? Love the sin. Hate the sinner. <laughs> All right, I, I, I messed that up on purpose. <laughs> we love the sinner, but we hate the sin. That sounds pretty Christian, doesn't it? You know who said that? Mahatma Gandhi, somebody who had no use for Jesus Christ, no use for Christianity. Somebody who tried to pawn himself off on the world as some great religious prophet. We don't have to talk about God. I've talked about Gandhi before. You want to know, you know, you can just look up Gandhi on Wikipedia and see all the hypocrisy in his life. He was no prophet. He's no leader of people. What's the moral of the story? Being nice, is that going to get us to heaven? Being clean? Loving the sinner and hating the sin? Is that going to make us holy? No. The moral of the story is that Abraham was in a covenant. All you got to do, keep your finger, turn back to Genesis chapter 12. God said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land I'll show you, and I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So what God says, Abraham, I'm going to make a covenant with you. I want you to get out of your country. I want you to leave your family, leave your father, go to this land I will show you. And then you do this, you do that, and then I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. And that's called a covenant. And everything God said, Abraham obeyed. And he did. He departed as the Lord spoke to him. Verse 4, and everything he did, so God, Abraham obeyed. And God, Abraham said, okay, God, I'm going to do what you said. And he entered into the covenant, and so he's God's covenant man. In Genesis 15, verse 1, it says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Don't be afraid, Abram. Don't be afraid. Don't worry. Don't fear somebody's going to try to capture your wife. Don't fear somebody's going to try to steal your sheep, your camels, your oxen, etc., etc. Et I'm going to take care of you. He says, I am your shield and your exceedingly great reward. So God's saying, I'm your shield. Not only does God take the part of his children, but he protects you. He defends you. He says, Abraham, I'm your shield. You know, how much time and how much energy do we spend trying to protect ourselves, trying to defend ourselves, if we just give it up to God and let God defend us and trust in God and not trust in our own might, our own power, our own strength, our own riches, and let God be our shield and let God be our reward. And then in Genesis 15, he says, I'm going to give you a son. Genesis chapter 17, when Abraham was 90 years old, the Lord said, Abraham, walk, uh, I'm almighty God. Walk before me and be thou blameless. I will make a covenant with you, with me and you, and will multiply you exceedingly. 
And verse 4, he says, For me, behold, my covenant is with you. You shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but you will be called Abraham. I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations come out of you. Kings shall come out of you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for an everlasting covenant. And then Genesis 17, God said, This is the sign of the covenant circumcision. So they practiced circumcision in the Old Testament to prove that they were in that covenant. And so what's the moral of the story? Here's a man in covenant who commits a sin. He's caught, he's embarrassed, and yet God's taken his part. And then you have nice people who do everything right, pay their bills on time, pay their taxes on time. Car registration is always, uh, you know, sent in months in advance. Uh, They have the inspection sticker there months in, in advance of the due date. I mean, they live life uh, their, their lawn is mowed meticulously every week, whether it rains or whether it's dry. I mean, that's really how people are judged today. What does that tell us? It tells us that a bad man who's in covenant with God is better than a good man who's outside of covenant with God. You hear that? A man who's a sinner who commits a sin, but he's in covenant with God, is better than a good man and a nice guy who makes you feel so pleasant when you're in conversation and company with him, but he's outside of Jesus Christ. And, beloved, that's the worst sin to be caught in, is to be ambivalent to the covenant of Jesus Christ. Psalm 118. This is a beautiful psalm. Let me just say this. God defends us. He defends his children. And and nobody knew the defense of God like King David. When he was on the run... And you can pick, you can almost crack, you know, you crack your Bible out in the middle, right down the middle, you'll open up to the book of Psalms. And you don't have to flip the, the book of Psalms uh, open very long when you find some place where, God, where David is crying out for God to defend him, and God will defend him. In Psalm 118, 5 through 7, that's just a, one psalm I picked out, it could have been any psalm. He said, I called on the Lord in distress, the Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. The Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? What can man do to me? You know, that's the question this morning. What can somebody do to you when God is your Father? He's your shield. He's your protection. He said, I'm going to bless those. Not only will He bless us, He said, I'll bless those who bless you. You know, when you're around God's company, people profit. People get blessings. Just being around the covenant man of God. Not only is the covenant man of God prospering, but everybody around him seems to be blessed. And you know what? When you keep company with sinners and evildoers, when you keep the wrong company and you walk in the way of sinners and you sit in their seat of the scornful, what happens? You seem to get the curses of those people seem to come upon you. God's not mocked. Whatsoever man sows, that shall he also reap. God is not mocked. Evil company corrupts good morals. Those are the two great God is not mocked scriptures in the Bible. What is man? What can man do to me? For the Lord is for me among those who help me. The truth is is that God always provides. God always rallies around. And sometimes we know the will of God by our Christian brothers and sisters. There's a time to listen to the Bible. There's a time to pray. But then there's a time to listen to the godly counsel and advice of the faithful saints. And David said, God has provided people around me. And look at this. This blew my mind when I read this. Therefore, I'm in Psalm 118.7. Therefore, I shall see my desire on those who hate me. That blew my mind. I shall see my desire on those who hate me. You know what that means? It means God will turn your very enemies and will use them as pawns to accomplish God's will in the grand chess match of life. And the grand scheme of things, the people who oppose us in the Lord, the enemies of God, God will use them to accomplish his very own purpose. And David said, I've seen it. I've seen the righteousness of God upon my enemies. So God defends his children. And he'll defend you. And he'll defend me. And you know, beloved, that makes me feel so good because I I hate having to defend myself. You ever feel like that? You know, you've got to defend yourself, and you know, you might as well not even bother. How can we defend ourselves? How can we defend ourselves against Satan, the great accuser? We can't. And I'll tell you, I'd rather have God defend me than to try to defend myself, because God's defense is just superior. 
Jesus loves us. God is near to the human race. He's near to alien sinners. God takes care of his children. He takes their part. Even when they're undeserving, he takes their part. He defends them against their enemies. But last of all, he says, I call you my friends. How would you like to be called a friend of God? Abraham was called a friend of God. In John 15, 14 and 15, Jesus says, You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. You know, isn't that great spirituality, being in a covenant with Jesus Christ? There are people that, you know, the Bible says God is not a respecter of persons. Did you know that? All through the Bible. He judges every man according to his works. He judges us according to what we do. He judges us according to our deeds. In other words, God is fair. There's no such thing as an unconditional election. Anytime I read my Bible, I see that salvation and election is conditioned. It's conditioned on our faith. It's conditioned on our obedience. It's conditioned by what we do. Jesus said, this is friendship with God, that you do whatever I command you. Now, what has God commanded us to do? Men and brethren, what shall we do? Repent and be baptized. Every one of you. You think God's going to make an exemption? Think God's going to make an exception? Jesus says, this do in remembrance of me. You know, the early church, Acts 20, chapter 20, verse 7, took the Lord's Supper every Lord's Day, every first day of the week. How many religions today take the Lord's Supper every first day of the week? Well, if we take it every first day of the week, it'll get commonplace. Well, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, take the collection every first day of the week. I notice you <laughs> taking the collection never gets commonplace. Well, yeah, oh, we've got to pay our bills. Uh, oh, we've got all kinds of bills to pay. Oh, I never think of, uh, you know, not passing the collection plate every Sunday. How much more? What's more important, the collection or the Lord's Supper? What's more important, the checks or the blood which sanctified us, in which we continue? Baptism is how we get in the covenant, but the Lord's Supper is how we, get it, how we stay in the covenant. And we're faithful to that covenant. And that covenant is faithful to us. It's so easy, isn't it? Being a Christian. And basically all we have to do is, is be faithful to the Lord's Supper. Come around, take that Lord's Supper. And do what Jesus said to do. There's a few more things, by the way. We need to go. Be faithful unto death. Paul said to the unbelieving Jew, you need to believe and confess. Peter said to the believing Jew, at the beginning, you need to repent and be baptized. The apostle John, at the end, says, be thou faithful unto death. Now, which apostle's right? Peter, Paul, or John? They're all right. You've got to believe. You've got to repent. You've got to confess. You have to be immersed into Christ. And you have to be thou faithful unto death. And that's the words of Peter, Paul, and John, as Jesus gave them authority. And Jesus said, you are my friends. No longer do I call you servants. A servant doesn't know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. What more can we say? Is God able to do what he promised? Can he do even more than we can pray? Even more we can ask? Even more than we can think? He took Abraham's part. He took David's part. He took Paul's part. And he'll take our part. And he'll be not just your God, not just your Father. He'll be your friend. Is God there for us? Is there anybody outside of the family of God? You know, God can't take the part of somebody who's not in his family. He can't take the part and give you the blessings. He can't give you the inheritance if you're not a son. And how do we become a child of God? How do we become... A Christian, you've got to be born into the family. And the seed is the word of God. And when you hear that seed, it penetrates your heart and faith begins to grow. And faith is conceived. And there's a conception that takes place. And Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. The more you hear this word of God, the more you begin to believe. And you put the scriptures together and you realize that God is true and every man is a liar when you boil it all down. And then comes the new birth, and that's what baptism is. You've got to have faith, the conception, and then you've got to have the delivery, and that's baptism because you come out of water. A little baby comes out of a little baptistry tank right inside the mama's womb. And do you know that in the watery grave of baptism, we are born of water and spirit? 
to enter into the kingdom of God. And then that's not the end. That's the beginning, isn't it? That's the beginning of the life. And that's the beginning of the life of a Christian because Paul said in Romans 6 that when you are delivered from that water, you're raised up and you walk in a newness of life. Is there anybody who needs the newness of life today? You come down at this moment because we're extending the invitation. You can't join the Christian family. You're born into it. God adds you. Is there anybody who'd like to be added to the family of God? God loves us, doesn't he? He's faithful. He forgives. He pardons. He loves us. He's there for us. And we're friends of God. Let's bear these thoughts in mind as we come around the Lord's table.